Hello everybody, this is me, this is Toby, welcome back to the channel. Sorry that I didn't post a lot of videos uh, the last couple of weeks, I've been moving house and things have been really busy, but now I thought I will make another one and uh, see how it goes. So today uh, it's going to be a little bit of a different subject, uh, the little blender project that was uh, in my last videos, it's more or less done from my part. Compositing is being worked on right now and the music and sound design are also being produced, which is really cool. Um, and hopefully end of the month, I'm going to have some more things to share there. In the meantime, a friend of me approached me, uh, his name is Rodrigo Costa. I've been helping him the last couple of years to realize um, a little project that he has in the works, kind of a bit of a fantasy theme. And the project is Plot Twist. And uh, it's already in production, more or less, supposed to become a short film and then maybe something more. Um, and he has a couple of people doing assets for him right now. And the look is not as um, consistent as he wants it to be. So he asked me if I could help out with making a little style guide. And this is what I want to walk with you through today. Uh, on maybe a little tutorial on how to make a style guide and what to look out for there. So first of all, I'm um, going to show you some of the artworks that I produced um, for the project. So this one here, this one here, and uh, those artworks are really what um, are taken by the team as like a benchmark and say like, okay, this is the look that we want to create here. You can see it's not like a very abstracted style. Uh, it's kind of somewhere in the middle between like cartoony and uh, realistic. Um, not really Disney, maybe a little bit more on the stylized side, but sort of Disney-ish. And um, yeah, there we go. And another one. Um, the other thing that he sent me were a couple of assets that the team built. Um, I'll show you over here, like a barrel and an envelope trunk, a couple of books, bucket. This is one of the main characters. It's like very successful in my opinion. I'm gonna get to that uh, later on what makes an asset successful and what not. Another main character, which has still some issues, I think, and we're gonna get to that later. Um, lantern, helmet, a house, which is also a very, very nice one. Um, there's a pole, a couple of vial, a uh, billboard, a pick, a torch, a torch, and there we go. This is the gist of it, roundabout. Cool. So I set out to do a style guide and basically trying to define what shall make this project look um, out, what shall define it. This is one of the key artworks in front. So, um, first of all, try to write down what is the project all about, what are we shooting for, and try to formulate it in a couple of very simple sentences. It's looking for a balance between stylization and realism. The look has to support slapstick, the classical, like, cloudy with a chance of meatball stuff, as well as more serious and emotional beats, as you would find in a Disney movie. And the look should be easily digestible and appeal to a mainstream audience. It's also important, it's not supposed to be a cool indie film for festivals. It's supposed to be like a commercial project, so you would go for a bit more of, an, of a mainstream look. But this is also tough to do, and it uh, may appear simple, but there's a lot of things to consider here. So, let's start off with the characters. I did some research, I also received some references from the director on um, how the characters were um, aiming, basically. And I think like Disney's Tango, it's a very nice example here. We have like characters that are a little bit stylized, like this guy over here, but especially the main characters are sort of realistic, um, but still maintain a lot of cartoonish expression abilities, basically. There's a lot of wiggle room on all the facial features to move the faces around. And also, I've got some negative examples here and wrote down why exactly those examples are a little bit in the wrong direction, maybe, when trying to design a character for the project. Um, 
This one is an example of a character that is too realistic. This is from everybody's favorite ogre, Shrek 2, um, when he's in the human form. So this is a very realistic character. It's like realistic hair sim on the chest. There, you look at his arms, there's like veins pushing through the skin, which makes it really feel like tactile and, and, um, and gritty almost. And if you look at the hand here, and also the face, like those cheekbones and on those knuckles, you almost see the, the bones pushing through. So this is a character where you can believe, okay, there's actually like bones and organs and like, and like fat and tissue underneath the skin. And this is maybe not something that we wanna that we wanna convey exactly. Also, the skin is fairly desaturated. There's a lot of like variety and tones and colors in here, and it dips into like very dark areas here. Like it becomes very it's not black, but it's for example up here under here under the hair, very dark cloth sims, only very detailed. Um, the folds here are like microscopic, almost like real fabric would behave. And realism is not always something that is um, helpful when developing a look like this. Um, this is another example that is pushing a bit too far in the other direction. It's from an um, advertisement series from for Lineage, Red Knight. And you see that this character is the exact opposite of this one over here. Look, the hands like, look at the proportions. The hand is giant, only has four fingers, Simpson style. There's no indication whatsoever that this character has any sort of like real anatomy, like bones or organs. So it's just like a blob which makes him look like a rubber toy, basically. Just what the what the art direction was striving for, um, I assume. Then cloth sim, if there's any in here, it's not visible. There's, it appears to be no cloth skin in here. And um, also the skin tone, just like the colors, it's like very blocky. It's like... The skin is all one tone, it's brown on the leather is all one tone, so very like unvaried and again getting into this rubber toy look. All right, so I'm um, trying to break down all of this and basically this is what I'm trying to do when making a style guide here, right? So I uh, showed those examples and now I try to figure out what makes these examples look the way they are. And when it comes to characters, uh, the first thing to look at is how is the character proportioned. So head, always a good place to start because the face is where we look, first of all. Um, and here I made a little example for the eye line because that's a very easy thing to um, shove around in order to like increase or decrease the level of stylization. So this would be a naturalistic face where the eye line is perfectly in the middle after our composition rules. And if we go down here to like very stylized characters, then you would find that the eye line can be like very, very up or down, like in relation to the normal face. Like this one has a giant forehead, this one has a giant chin. It's gonna be really cool if you wanna really push your character design. So like play around with those kind of basic rules of character construction. And where we wanna land for plot twist is somewhere in the middle there, leaning a bit more to the naturalistic side. So I made this example where we push the eye line down here a little bit, a couple of centimeters where it normally is. And this is a basic rule for how to proportion things, just mildly exaggerating, but not too much. This is also something um, where we try to get away from this basically Shrek level of like realism in characters, which can be very awkward. So made it a little dummy head here. And um, something that is very important when um, thinking about levels of stylization is the simplicity of contours. Like how much is your character design based on a basic geometric shape? Like for the head, it would be like a circle and a square down here, basically. And you can see in this example, which I stated as a negative example, this outline is very broken up. You have the head curve up here, you have the cheekbones protruding, you have a little edge here down at the mouth, and the chin is its own separate thing. And also there's a lot of things going on in the flat surface of the face, like there's like little tear sacs, like crow's feet, you have like cheek prones protruding from it. This will create like a shadow and light situation on the cheek. 
and those kind of very pronounced nose folds. That is basically, by the way, something that people mess up a lot of times when they're trying to design like um, children characters or like if you try to draw a baby, for example, if you uh, overdo it with this line here between the nostril and the edge of the mouth, then this will age your character instantly. Like, so we decided for more of a, of a smooth um, look here. And also what is very important, even if you have very stylized characters, but just as a reminder, all the facial features uh, need a little bit of a wiggle room. You see this sometimes in the stylization that is maybe not done in a correct way, where there is an expression already baked into the face, that a character always looks grumpy or always looks happy or so. Um, and this is because the elements are pushed too far to a certain edge and don't have enough space to move around. So this is a neutral face, and we can imagine now that the nose and the eyes, they can deform, they can like stretch and squash, the mouth could open really wide and uh, form different facial expressions, which is very important when you want to show like the characters emoting and going through different stages of emotions. And uh, the last thing on this page is the amount of visible eye white, which is also a very crucial thing to think about when thinking about like appealing characters. If you look at those examples up here, compared to a real human, the amount of white in the eye is massively exaggerated. An extreme example would be, of course, like Disney characters like Donald Duck or Mickey Mouse who have like giant white eyes with just a tiny little dot for the eye. And um, yeah, so this is like an attempt to, um, to schematize this thing that we have a lot of eye white. Again, this is wiggle room for the iris to move around and also um, to avoid this situation here where the uh, iris is wedged between the upper and the lower eyelid. Um, this like just, all of this like just takes away possibilities to move things around in space. And this is what you wanna do. You wanna show in your character design, you wanna show potential for movement and for animation. This is uh, a little sheet uh, relating to the hair. Um, I'm employing a principle here on this side, which will return later when we talk about like plants and vegetation, which is a clustering. So I won't uh, talk too much about this. Um, an important thing here for me was just that the curvature of the hair, and this is also like just like a general rule of thumb, um, to keep in mind that you try to avoid just like curves with like a linear, uh, how is it called? Like a linear bent angle that is just like going like a circle all the way around the bend. Um, just always in the same angle, basically. So the idea is that you have a curve that it's starting very sharp and it's like easing out into more of a straight and then it's increasing the curvature again and curving out of it again. What this does is using clear statements. This is funny enough, a technique that is also employed in, um, in vehicle design, in like real life car design. Um, if you look at a real life car, like you will rarely find any angle or any bend that is like the same bend level all the way around. They always, curves are either increasing or decreasing in, um, in curvature level, basically. And this was just to keep it tidy, cluster them around a big strand. But uh, we can talk about the plants later on, a little bit more about this. And here we go to environment. Um, also, I have to mention, this is like a very, very simple style guide. I just spent like two, three days doing that or so. Um, obviously, you have like a big feature film project. The style guide will be much more involved and you have to put much more time into it. And I'm probably going to expand this document as the project goes on. There's like more challenges uh, to be found and to be defined. But uh, this is what I have right now. So uh, to the environments. Um, before in this asset gathering, uh, I showed you the asset of this house. And this is, um, in my opinion, an almost perfect asset. I'm going to link the artists in the description below, by the way, if you want to check out their other work. Um, and when looking at this, you get the feeling of, oh, wow, this is a cool production-ready asset. 
Um, it's designed in a very harmonic way. There's a lot of things going around, a lot of things to look at, um, and without being overloaded. So just it harmonizes with itself. And uh, I try to define like what makes this asset good and what are some rules that we can get out of this uh, in order to inform what uh, the other artists are doing. So one thing that this asset does very great, which is another basic design rule, which can be um, remembered and applied to great effect, is the alternation between uh, straight lines and curves in the object's outline. So I made a little schematic here. So you see, for example, the roof is curved in the outward direction, right? This is like, if you look from here, that would be concave. And then it's when you follow the line, here's a straight line, and here's a convex line, so it's altering. And here we go straight again. It doesn't, it's not like a, a perfect rule of thumb, but um, concave, straight, straight. Here's like, again, one that's concave, and here's one that would be convex. So you see there's like an alternation in the contour, which gives it a great level of visual interest. Um, another thing that I think this house there did very well, and um, I didn't see any assets in the, in the lineup that I felt were like too much pushing into a um, certain direction, but I wanted to like nail it down in a, uh, in a concrete sheet anyways, is the, um, the slimness of things. So um, if you want to make a stylized look, you want to avoid those kind of tiny hair thin edges. Like if you draw a barrel, for example, here, you want to avoid is little screws and nails in the barrel that are the same size as uh, real life screws or nails, because that would make it really busy at the distance and it wouldn't read very well. So make this other example uh, here where I increase the size of those screws um, you can, if you want, push that even more. If you want to go into a more stylized look, then you would end up with a look like you would find, for example, in World of Warcraft or so. They're like the kings of giant rivets, rivets and giant spikes everywhere. I'm sure you're aware of the look, but uh, this is also a good um, example on how to push stylization, how to nail down the level of stylization if you want to employ in your project. Also, what works great, um, is the way that this house is lattice deformed. If I just go back one page, you see that there's no two lines that are really just like perfect 90 degree angles. There seems to be a lattice deformer applied to the whole building that's kind of squished the top together a little bit. So this line is angling a little bit towards here. This line is angling a little bit more towards here. And this is also a great thing to remember that you want to avoid those perfect 90 degree angles here that makes it look really mechanic and like factory produced and obviously with fantasy setting you want everything to look uh, handmade and handcrafted and this is a great way to achieve this sort of thing to let us deform all your objects a little bit and lastly how to treat straight edges it's a bit delayed um, related to that lattice deform thing but um if you have a piece of wood, for example, or stone or so, you want to age it a little bit. And the way to do it in a bit of a cartoony way is to chip the edges. So um, instead of having, if this is for example, a leg of a chair or something, having those perfectly straight lines here, you would try to break up the contour a little bit by like taking a little chip out of there. Maybe somebody bumped into there with a like big wooden thing or so. Um, Maybe a, a little splinter came off here. So, you know, how would be this when um, age takes its toll? All right. Um, coming now to basic object placement in the world. And this is like a, also a rule of thumb for design in general. If you want to design a scene, no matter if you want to compose something in like framing or if um, you want to just, as in the example before, put hair on the character's head. It's always great to think about ways to cluster objects together. And the way to cluster object is you take a central element, which should be, which is like your center of attention. Like take those are schematics up here and I made drew three examples of uh, this applied in practice, basically. 
First off, we have a building, like a castle, and we have this one big giant block in the middle here. Just very little going on, just like uh, a massive centerpiece. And radiating out from the centerpiece, you see that those elements get smaller and smaller and smaller, almost exponentially. And the same principle I try to apply to those stones. You have this big central stone, and next to it, a little smaller. And going out there, it gets exponentially smaller until the asset is at its end, basically. Same here for the trees, center tree. Little ones and petering out into grass and small shrubbery and things. And um, this just helps to reduce visual clutter. Like you're forced to cr create a center of interest in everything that you're designing, which helps just like guide the viewer's eye through the scene as well, help tidy up your imagery. Um, here's some things for uh, trees, plants in general. Um, so in order to avoid realistic looking trees in quotation marks. Um, I also found it um, very important to state that we wanted to um, base all trees on simple geometric shapes. For leaf trees, it would be spheres. So everything should be constructed around spheres that are overlapping each other more than they don't. So you see that this is a central sphere. Again, clustering, as I said before, on the last page. And here's smaller and smaller spheres uh, coming out of there. <clears throat> and this will avoid this kind of sprayed, frayed silhouette that you would find in a realistic looking tree. Um, like in a project like this, especially if there's not so many people working on it, um, sometimes um, the temptation is big to just say, oh, I'm just going to use like a speed tree plugin to render like realistic trees because it's just background or so. But uh, in my opinion, this never quite works out and always looks a bit less professional than, it, than you want it to be. So, I mean, do it, but just be aware that this will be like probably not consistent with your start unless you're going for something really, really realistic. Um, same here with like a, a fir tree, which is based on a triangle, with this pyramid shape. And I try to make with everything that I um, drew here as an example, I try to make a clear statement. So this tree is bottom heavy, that means the crown is the defining feature, and it's pushing down. And in those here, um, the crown is very light, it's at the top, and those tree trunks are the defining feature of the structure. And I try to not go in the middle. I try to either make the statement, okay, this is low to the ground, and this is high up, and not like middle ground, which is also good practice to get into, try to make those clear statements. Um, with the trunk, a little bit with wood in general, it's a bit similar to what we saw before in furniture. Um, this is just basic attempt to trying to steer people away from doing um, doing like very basic cylinder shapes for everything because that's usually not how trees look in real life, and it's also not very interesting the way the light behaves on it. So trying to push people towards getting. Um, Little, little dents and little edges, making the, the, the cut surface, basically. If you would cut through it to make this kind of uneven, like a real piece of wood would behave like. And for uh, thick trunks here, I went into like braiding. So if you have like, if you think of um, this trunk as like strands of geometry, I'm trying to take this like big leading strands and trying to weave them in and out, uh, seeing that they're like emerging from underneath the other strand and like wrapping around and on top, like like a braid, like here in this uh, example. And uh, this is some basic stuff for the environment. Um, for materials, I'm returning to that house because I am, again, I feel like this is a very successful example uh, for almost everything. Um, something that is very important also looking at a couple of assets. You can go through it afterwards again, looking at the assets and seeing what, what works and what doesn't in the examples that were given. But um, all the materials should have like a clear identity, color and brightness. Like I made this little schematic view here. Uh, the colors are literally just picked out of this rendering. So this works really great. We have uh, two different kinds of wood, which are very distinct in color, hue and brightness. We have stone, 
uh, of the wall. Um, there would be another one for the, the drywall here, but omitted it. It's just an example after all. And we have this blue roof tile. And um, the idea is that you can use photographs as textures. Like this is obviously also a photographic texture of wood, but you have to like tint it. This is an example for it. I just grabbed this off the internet somewhere. So this is a piece of wood and you see there's a lot of like color variation inside of the texture, there's a lot of brightness variation. There's a lot of micro detail as well. And to get this kind of in the middle detail level, I just try to uh, smooth it over a little bit, reduce this micro detail and give it a uniform brown color that we can say like, okay, this wood is brown, this stone is uh, bluish, grayish, and uh, the roof tiles are like um, turquoise. And um, yeah, this is also great to, for not over busying your scene with visual interest. And another example here, it's always cool to see that your materials maintain their identity in any given light setting, which is also not the case in real life. I mean, in the night, things look just very different or like it's muddled together. But for the sake of like this fantasy stylization, I thought it's good to give this example. All right, so this does it for the style guide. And maybe we can have a little look at the assets again and see how they fare. Let me just scroll back to the beginning here. So with this barrel here, what do we notice? So I think this is uh, looking pretty good already. Um, something that I would maybe try to work on is the amount of like brightness variations and the textures it gets really dark and really bright here with this kind of little dirt pass. And I'm feeling this is just a tiny bit too realistic for the look that we're going for. This one here, the anvil looks quite good to me, but this tree trunk here, this is really just like, you, you see that there's just a couple of geometry pieces shoved inside of there, and it's missing this kind of, um, this kind of interest of a real piece of wood, as we saw before, you know, where you're trying to avoid these kind of perfect cylindrical shapes a little bit. And with this big piece of wood, I would also love to see some of this braiding going on that I mentioned before. Um, also the texture is just like very, very photorealistic with a lot of like variation in hue, color, brightness whatsoever. Books, I think look really fine to me. The bucket is also a very, very nice asset. Very cool. Um, this character here, in my opinion, works also really great. Um, the head has a very simple contour. It's just a big oval. The same goes for the body. Like the outlines are really simplified and the eyes, even though they dip into like a very black territory, there seem to be a lot of like space here in order to like let this guy um, get into different emotional states, right? Like you can imagine this face to deform into like a sad face or like a, a happy face or so. Right now he looks very grim, but you can easily imagine him to look different. This one here, I think still needs a little bit of work. So uh, for example, the face you see, this iris here is penetrating the upper and the lower eyelid, uh, which makes him, gives him this kind of tired look, which seems baked into his face. Um, the hair, it's a little bit, the curvature doesn't seem to be really decided. It seems a little bit like random strums, uh, strands of clay without having this kind of clear shape language, like I indicated in the design document. And also, if you look at this geometry that is like indicating fur that's wrapping around his neck, it's really like lumpy. There's not like a clear curve going on anywhere here. And uh, this is something that I would love to see rework maybe a little bit. And lastly, we remember this example with the, um, with the house and the concave and convex and straight lines alternating. If you look at the frontal view of his shoulder pauldrons here, you have like a straight, a straight, and another straight. So there's another piece of potential where we could possibly generate some more visual interest in by, um, by just like alternating the contours a little bit between curved and straight lines. Lantern, I will not go over everything. Again, great asset right here. 
This is also cool, like the chipped edges of this one here. No straight lines, it seems to be like lattice deformed a little bit. Very cool asset. This one, I also love it. Um, this one here, fill the edges a little bit too thin. Those rivets, they seem a little realistic. Nick, also a great character, love him. Um, and there you go. Boom. So um, I hope this was um, this was interesting for you, and um, you learned something. And uh, I hope you're also okay that this was another Blender video. Um, I hopefully gonna go back to this content. But in the meantime, maybe you found this enjoyable as well. I sure did. And um, yeah, hope to see you guys next time. Bye.